Good evening, everyone. As we gather tonight within the vibrant corridors of NYU Wagner, I invite you to consider a question. How have inclusive policies touched your lives or the lives of those you know? We're here at the intersection of public administration, urban planning, health, and united by a principle deeply meaningful to me and likely to many of you, equity and policymaking. Our gathering is a reflection of NYU's unwavering commitment to tackling the critical issues that impact our urban environments and our approaches to addressing them. My name is Judy Wynn, and I stand before you as a first-generation graduate student from Canada with a story that echoes the hope and resilience of many families around the world. My parents, fleeing Vietnam by boat, sought refuge and a chance at a new life in 1988. Their journey was marked by months of uncertainty until a Canadian family's kindness le led to my family's sponsorship eight months later. This experience stands as a testament to the power of inclusive policies and the difference they can make in people's lives. This journey has deepened my appreciation for the role of fairness in shaping our governance strategies. It's about creating pathways for those who start their journey at a disadvantage, ensuring that everyone, regardless of their origin, race, education, or income level, has access to opportunities that can transform their lives. In a city like New York, where residents speak over 200 languages, the economy thrives on the hard work and innovation of immigrants. Thus, embracing our newest asylum seekers is not just an act of compassion, it's a continuation of our city's legacy. So tonight, we are honored to welcome Mr. Bill de Blasio, the former mayor of New York City and the 2023 Marnold Visiting Fellow. His tenure as mayor was marked by a relentless pursuit of justice and equity, notably during the COVID-19 pandemic. He has been a trailblazer from achieving record enrollments in the universal pre-K program to making significant strides in addressing the housing crisis and homelessness. His advocacy for fair wages and comprehensive plan to combat climate change through the NYC Green New Deal highlight his forward thinking in urban policy. So let's seize this moment to reaffirm our commitment to crafting fair strategies essential for a just and sustainable future, while honoring the resilience and vitality that our collective diversity brings to our ever evolving city. Please join me in welcoming to an extraordinary leader and agent of change, Bill de Blasio. Judy, thank you so much. And I want to say, I really appreciate starting the discussion with one person's story because, and I like, and I, you editorialized there and I'm glad you did, that we're in the middle of a huge discussion and debate in this country and in this city about what some call a migrant crisis, but you're also pointing out the essential humanity and the connection to our values and our history that makes us think maybe there's other ways to think about this moment. And you're a example of it in the way you're contributing right here in New York City. So let's all thank Judy. Thank you. So Judy was also too kind, um, but I will say sometimes our visions worked and came to life. Sometimes we struggled, but what was true from the beginning, which she indicated is the whole idea of my administration was to address inequality. And again, tonight, anyone who wants to challenge or question the things that worked or didn't work, that's a very healthy conversation because I'd be right there with you having spent now the last two years thinking about the things that did work, but also spending a lot of time kicking myself about the mistakes we made or the things we missed or the things we should have prioritized. But what was abundantly clear was we started with a very simple concept and that sustained. So tonight, as we talk about the way to think about equity and policy making, I'm going to begin with simplicity. The way to think about equity and policy making is to talk incessantly about equity when making policy. 
It sounds small or simple. It's not. We literally made a habit. In some ways, we systematized it, obviously, with measures and with accountability dynamics. But it really began with saying, this is what we're here to do. I feel bad for the people in the back who I can't see, so I'm going to try and range over here a little bit. Um, it really came down to saying this was our mission. If we were not addressing inequality, we were allowing a status quo to continue, which was unacceptable. When I ran for mayor, I talked about a tale of two cities, which is a theme borrowed from Charles Dickens and was recycled by many, many leaders over time. But it was sadly very urgent and apparent in New York City at that moment, particularly after the administration of Michael Bloomberg. And one of the stark contrast points was the fact that Mayor Bloomberg, in his own conception of the free enterprise system and his own success, sort of saw a world that was working in which there were some problems, but the essential model was working. I saw a world in which the essential model was not working, where inequality was so deep-seated in the life of New York City that it actually threatened our ability to be a successful city and to be consistent with our values going forward. My campaign was about the fact that we were getting close to a tipping point and that we had to do things very, very differently. So I begin by saying, if this phrase, equity in policymaking moves you, then I want you to understand it is an everyday activity, that there is almost no policy area where there isn't an equity lens needed. It's interesting how some folks might say, you know, well, let's take some obvious ones, maybe course education or course housing, of course policing, but just keep going, go into transportation, go into any area you can think of. And the equity lens has power. Go into personnel, which is an area we really focused on. I don't think I'm gonna shock anyone in this room by saying if you get your personnel right, you can perform an equity agenda energetically. But if you try to take an equity agenda and layered on a group of people who are totally uh, believers in the status quo or have been inculcated with status quo approaches only, don't be shocked if your wonderful policies don't go very far. So we had you know, very overt discussions in our team. Were we creating a government that looked like New York City? And it, I wasn't afraid of talking numbers and facts agency by agency and trying to ensure that when we gave an instruction or we passed a piece of legislation, it would actually come to life down to the grassroots. And that was all about the people who did the implementing. When we talked about things like support through the massive, I and mean, we're talking about a hundred billion dollar budget in New York City, the support that we could provide to businesses owned by women and people of color, we needed to be very explicit about the fact that we needed to set high goals, we needed to have them be very public, they needed to be accountability structures, and we needed to recognize and celebrate the fact that those businesses would turn around and hire people from their own communities, keep our money in our city, in our neighborhoods, credential so many people to become the next business owners and creators. So the consciousness is the foundation, the persistence, the ability to take that idea and recognize it needs to pervade every part of what you do. And if you haven't aligned your personnel, and that is both the selection of your personnel, by definition, people with kindred values, people who had the rigor, the energy to want to pursue such a policy, but it's also what are you doing regularly to hold them accountable and to ensure that this conversation pervades. I had some people on my team who were absolute believers in an equity agenda, but who did not actually implement an equity agenda and not out of malice, out of distraction. Some of our biggest and most complex agencies dealing with crises all the time, if you sat down quietly in a room like this and said, how much do you care about an equity agenda? You would hear a real passion. But then you said, how much of your day are you putting into an equity agenda? You would see a drop off. And I understood keeping the schools going or building housing, you choose whatever area, it's rigorous and difficult and it always feels like there's another crisis. But it was a little scary to me that I would have to call people, literally have to call heads of agencies into my office 
who were amongst the most vocal on equity and asked them why their personnel didn't look more like New York City or why they weren't doing more to purchase from women-owned and people of color-owned businesses. So that overview point, I just want to imprint strongly. It can be done. I'm very proud to say at the end of our administration, the Independent Budget Office, which is truly independent in New York City, did a study and showed that we were actually able to address income inequality in a very meaningful and tangible way with a variety of policies, pre-K for all, after-school programs, affordable housing programs, raises for our city workers, paid sick leave, a whole host of policies that put money back in people's pockets that actually worked in combination at a local level. It wasn't even waiting on the federal or state government. It worked. That was the positive and inspirational news. But the challenge is it only works. It's like the garden you have to water every day. It only works if there's immense attention and if everyone up and down the food chain believes the people in charge are judging them and weighing their actions according to how much they achieved in addressing inequality. That's the overview. Here's what I wanna do, and I'll do it quickly. I know my timekeeper is watching me at all times. So the, and I look forward to a dialogue. I wanna offer a case study. And from the case study, I'm gonna pull out a simple formula. The case study, as Judy mentioned, pre-K for all. The policy I love most, but also one that has profound ramifications in terms of equity now and well into the future. The formula I want to pull out of it is if you're going to be a change agent and if you're going to be someone who focuses effectively on equity, three R's, responsiveness, resiliency, and resourcefulness, which you'll see how it plays out in the example. I'll be very quick. The thing to know about pre-K for all and the thing that I think is inspirational that hasn't really been analyzed enough is this was not a front burner political and journalistic issue. If I could transport you into the room in 2013 to an average press conference with the New York City media, if I could take you to a mayoral forum where there was a host of issues being addressed, you would rarely hear anyone mention early childhood education unless it was me. So how on earth could something that wasn't on the agenda become prominent and ultimately successful? Because one of the things that all change agents need to understand, I don't, and whether you are someone in this room who wants to run for office and be in front of the camera, if you're someone who wants to be as far away from the camera as possible and work on policy, if you wanna be an advocate, if you wanna be in government, whatever your choice, the possibilities of change run through where an item stands on the public agenda and what kind of public support there is. And public support is not something that sort of falls from the sky, preformed. It's something you create in many instances. Sure, there are issues where you find there's already a demand. But a lot of times you not create the demand in the artificial sense, you create the demand by bringing the voices of the people to the fore and allowing them to be heard and to crystallize into something more. And that's going to get to the point about responsiveness in just a moment. The simple summary. For anyone who has ever had a dream, an idea you thought might be a little crazy, let me do a show of hands. Who has ever had a policy idea or a solution for the world's problems that they thought was amazing, but might be a little out there, might be a little too ambitious, might be a little crazy? Raise your hand. I love you all. I thank you. Don't ever change. So literally in a bar in Brooklyn in the fall of 2012 with my top policy advisor on education, a woman named Ursulina Ramirez, who played a crucial role in the development of pre-K. I was public advocate in New York City, an office with a lovely title and very little power. And I was preparing to run for mayor and we sat there and we literally had a napkin. We had a paper napkin and we had a pen. And we started like somehow the conversation turned to what would it take to do pre-K for all? Because we were 100% convinced 
that our education system was backwards, that we needed to reach kids when they were young, that we were missing the best opportunity to reach them during the prime time of their intellectual development, and that every time you ventured any kind of idea like that, you heard, oh, it was too expensive, it was too difficult, it was logistically impossible. So we said, you know what, why are we kind of buying into that? Why don't we like actually do our own math for a moment here? And we started doing our own math. And at that time, there were about 20,000 full day pre-K seats in New York City. There was a meaningful number of half day seats. I think it was 10,000 or so. But half day pre-K, and this is where responsiveness comes in, didn't do a whole lot for parents and kids. Being able to send your child to a school half day meant diminished education plus havoc in a parent's schedule and a possibility of a parent working. So we regard half day pre-K as kind of a, a band-aid at best. Our coin in the realm was full day pre-K, 20,000 seats. We did a little estimation of demand. We talked to a number of experts in the days following. We came to the conclusion real demand was between 60 and 70,000, proved to be absolutely accurate. So we basically needed to add 50,000 seats. And we started dreaming about what that would take. And in the days after we came to the conclusion that it was absolutely doable, the demand was there, particularly if we went out to parents and talked to them, that there would be teachers who very much wanted to be a part of it, that we could figure out the pieces if we had, now this will not shock you anyone, if we had the money. And it wasn't an obvious place to get the money. Now I have a much better idea of other places we could have gotten the money. At that time, it wasn't so obvious. So we thought about the history of New York City. We thought about what had worked in the past when there was an effort to do something transcendent. And we focused on the idea of a specialized tax on the wealthy, New York City, wealthy individuals, that would specifically and only pay for pre-K for all. And we added in after-school programs as well. And this idea took more shape, took more shape, and finally we decided let's just go with it. We knew it would be controversial. We knew it was not fully formed, and this is another lesson I would always give. It's wonderful to sketch out your policy ideas to the point of perfection to answer every question and every concern. That can also be paralyzing. We were, as I like to say about myself on many topics, I was unburdened by knowledge. I knew enough to see the problem and understood we understood we could do something about it. I did not see each and every roadblock enough to be paralyzed. We sketched out a basic plan. We figured out the basic finances. We figured out what the uh, taxation mechanism would be. And we decided to just go for it. And we had no idea how much impact it would make on the public imagination. And this is where I get back to the point that if you want to change the world, you have to think about the responsiveness to what the public really cares about, not what they're told they care about, not what journalists or politicians or experts tell them are important, but what do people really tell you? What are they talking to you about in their everyday life? And since I had spent years and years crisscrossing the city and listening to people, particularly parents, it wasn't hard for me to conceptualize that there was tremendous frustration, that there weren't options available for children, that it was holding back the kids in their development, it was holding back families from making income. It absolutely was a matter of equity because the children most disadvantaged were the children who had families with lower incomes. It was baking in inequality. There were so many things wrong and it was just absolutely unscientific too that we were reaching kids too late after the research and the science had long since proven that early child education was the thing that could be most effective. So the responsiveness, now I'll get into these three points quickly. The responsiveness is making sure your vision of social change is from the people. That doesn't mean you aren't leading the people. Again, there's a kind of give and take here. There's a kind of call and response. I was saying to the people, come with me to address inequality this way. And I got people thinking, talking, and I got attention on the issue, and more and more people talked, and it became it gained more and more momentum. And that's part of how we got the resources later on, was we created a political momentum far beyond anything we could have imagined. But it didn't come from 
my brain alone or Ursulina's brain or some study we read alone. It came from the constant conversation with people to know how this would deeply improve their lives and their children's lives. There are a thousand ways to address inequity, to say the least. I'm sorry there are a thousand ways, but it's so pervasive in our society and in human history. So when you're choosing which one you're going to do or which ones you're going to focus on, knowing that you're actually in dialogue with the people and that you can feel their lives, their needs, what they will coalesce around is absolutely crucial. The responsiveness to know what choice to make, the responsiveness to throughout your journey, listen to what's working and what's not making adjustments. I think sometimes good, good people in public life, in public service, fear adjustment because it might seem like weakness. It might seem like backsliding. It might seem like reconsidering your proposal and suggesting your proposal wasn't right. I actually have found the opposite to be true. Laying a basic foundation, but then being very willing to adjust with the conditions you meet. And a, a simple example, we thought in the beginning we could accommodate all of pre-K in our public school buildings. Bluntly, we massively miscalculated how much space was available. We had to make real adjustments, and those adjustments meant deciding which partners to partner with. There were huge ideological questions. Should we partner with charter schools? Should we partner with religious schools? And we took a very flexible approach and decided as we were experiencing this issue, as we we're experiencing this trajectory, that we would actually benefit from a broader coalition. And everything in life, especially in public life, is coalition building. Everything is about building that support to make something to give something the kind of momentum that can't be stopped, particularly when it's radical change. This was adding an entire additional grade to the school system. It was a radical action. We realized the bigger the tent, the more support, the more permanence. That wasn't necessarily how we saw it originally. It's what we learned along the way. So we responded to the voices of people in allowing us to formulate the vision, but then we responded as we saw challenges, as we saw problems, we responded by opening up our own minds and looking for different allies and different possibilities. And that actually ended up being a net gain. Now, resiliency, why resiliency? Because the second, the second, I'm not saying even the minute, the second you put out a policy and an idea that could fundamentally affront the status quo, you will be told you're either crazy, unrealistic, it won't work, it will backfire, You'll set back your cause because it will be such an embarrassing defeat. There are so many messages that happen instantly. My personal favorite when we proposed pre-K for all, and I, and I went actually to a business-oriented group uh, in October 2012 and proposed pre-K for all with a tax on the wealthy because I wanted to go in front of wealthy people and say, you should pay a little more to help kids go to school, to help our city be stronger, to have a a more fair and equitable society, to have a better workforce in the future, whatever motivation, I'm looking you in the eye and I'm telling you, you should pay a little bit more. And um, one of the very first responses came from the then mayor, Michael Bloomberg, who literally said, quote, he wants to drive everyone out of New York City. Now it's very interesting that the tax was on the wealthy and what he was contesting was that the tax would be a disincentive for people to live in New York City. Now, the tax was only on wealthy individuals, but he believed that wealthy individuals were everyone. It was one of these wonderful telling moments where the spontaneous language said so much. The everybody else except for the wealthy were going to get free pre-K for their kid or we're not going to be affected at all. And he said we were driving everyone out because his prism of the world was what was good for the wealthy was good for everyone else. The New York Times, the Daily News, a number of publications, pundits said it was a thoroughly unrealistic plan. So why am I talking about resiliency? Because whatever good you aim to do, 
the voices and the forces of the status quo will immediately try and get you to not believe in your own idea. They will try and invalidate it. They will try and psych you out. They will try and take away your confidence. They will try and stop your momentum before it starts. I don't mean to sound hyperbolic. I am not a conspiracy theorist. I've just been to this movie a lot of times. If, especially if you talk about equality issues and you talk about economic issues, and you talk about the fact that wealthy people, God bless them, but a very high percentage of wealthy people got there because of policies of the government that advantaged them. So it's not a level playing field. I don't think that's a shock to a lot of people in this room. So then when the government says, hey, let's, let's even up the score a little bit here and ask for something back so we can do something for everybody else, you will see a lot of institutional forces and voices that try and immediately make you think there's something wrong with you for proposing the idea. So it just was like endless. It was from like day one editorial board scoffing at it, usually along the lines of it being unrealistic. In fact, in the 2013 primary, the New York Times had like a couple of lines about me in their primary they, uh, endorsement uh, editorial. They endorsed someone else. They said, oh, Bill de Blasio has very you know, nice and aspirational ideas, but they'll never, ever happen. And I love that because I was like, well, if you thought the ideas were so good, why didn't you help me achieve them? But in fact, I've seen this pattern over and over and at many different levels. The resiliency is you have to believe enough that when you are surrounded by negative voices, that you don't buckle. And that sounds, you know, I could say it to you and you're like, oh, that doesn't sound so hard. That doesn't sound so strange. In fact, it's a really big deal. If you want to work on equity, I'll say it again very plainly. If you're going to address Inequity, if you're going to fight for equity, you are going against the status quo of all of human history. You are goring the ox of some people. You are immediately making some people uncomfortable. If you say to folks who have done very, very well, we need to do something differently, to a lot of them, that's an indictment. They take it very personally. Now, maybe they should. Maybe they should. But even if you don't mean it to be a personal indictment, the reaction is personal and emotional, plus it's strategic. If you achieve your vision of addressing inequality, what comes next? How much more inequality will be addressed? Where does this ever end? And so the impulse you will constantly see is to invalidate at the point of contact. And I have seen too many people fall for that trick. So to be a change agent takes immense self-control, discipline, respect for your own values, even when everything around you is telling you your plan can't work. And I often find two simple forms of language that are giveaways to me. Something can't work or it's impossible. What I came to learn was the minute someone tells you something is impossible, it is a reason to keep going. It is a validation that you're onto something. And when they tell you it can't work, that's people trying to suggest that change agents don't have capacity, that we can't think practically, that we can't think materially, that we are just dreamers. And I constantly found that, that attempt to sort of label and put in a box. The resiliency is the ability to listen to yourself, to listen to the people you believe in, to stick with your plan, to recognize, and I'm, this may sound you know, a little self-growth or something, but I think it's just fundamentally true. The number one problem with sticking to a change agenda is yourself. You, if you buckle, if you let them get to you, that's where things fall apart. If you're resolute enough and strong enough and resilient enough, it's, you'd be shocked at what you can get done. There are many times in 2013 in the campaign where I was this close to thinking we couldn't do it, and like, I wasn't going to quit, but I was kind of almost at a point of giving up internally. And there were times along the way on pre-K where we felt like we had totally painted ourselves into the corner by putting such an ambitious plan. And we wanted to go in just two years time from 20,000 kids to 70,000 kids in full day pre-K. And we said it publicly and we put all the pressure on ourselves. 
And there was an immense feeling at various moments. And I was, you know, running all these meetings, these quote unquote war rooms in City Hall. And there were so many times where people were kind of like, we're not going to make it. And that kind of, we've all felt moments of panic and we've all been to the movies where something's going on and disaster is about to strike and someone screams out, you know, we're not going to make it or someone panics and they have someone else has to calm them down. Well, we were all panicking at some point. Maybe quieter, maybe louder, but we at various points thought we weren't going to make it. And what was abundantly clear was we were potentially our own worst enemy. And it was only when we settled down, asked of each other, what could we do? What more could we do? How much more creative could we be? It was only when we stopped psyching ourselves out that we actually locked on to a pathway to victory. So that is responsiveness, that is resiliency, and now resourcefulness. And I'll conclude with this. Resourcefulness is the recognition that there's endless possibilities, there's endless tools I don't think we're taught to think about the tools. And I don't mean this like to indict any one part of society or any institution. I, when I say we're not taught, I'm reflecting on my own entire experience. Education, work in effect, apprenticing for other folks, coming up through different organizations. And when I add all together, it was always a culture of scarcity. I think... The go-to in any discussion of social change, in any discussion of governance, public governance, public policy, the go-to is scarcity. And it's understandable. There's never enough money to deal with the needs of our society or other resources, other tools. There's never enough. We get that. There's never enough personnel. It's definitionally accurate that there's a scarcity dynamic. It is literally everywhere. I was on the phone earlier today with some folks from the city government of Austin, Texas, and it just kept coming up through the dialogue. Staffing shortage, resource shortage. It's like, it's everywhere. It's in every part of the country. It's in every part of the world. There's almost no such thing as a government or an advocacy organization or an NGO that has enough. It's almost definitionally impossible. So we all have been taught to think about how to live within our limits how to kind of dumb down our ideas and minimize our vision because scarcity is pervasive. Well, I, I am blessed to say I was in New York City where there's proportionally more resources. I'm blessed to say I came along at a time with a good economy. There were definitely X factors in my favor. But I also had a city of almost 9 million people a quarter of whom were living below the poverty level and every other conceivable challenge of humanity concentrated in a small geographical area. And in the case of pre-K and schools, a school system that despite the nobility of the people who worked in it was clearly not reaching a high percentage of its kids. So with some advantages in hand, I still was dealing with massive problems. And I resisted the scarcity lens and I tried to teach others to resist the scarcity lens because it just destroys innovation. It destroys creativity. So the resourcefulness was asking ourselves what we actually had to work with, not what our standard understanding of things was. What did we actually have? I used the example before when we ran out of space, all the different organizations we could turn to, all of whom had a self-interest in working with us. That was an easy example. But we found that the government needed to be kind of re-engineered to achieve this task. And I have only five minutes left. I'm going to honor that. Thank you, Tara. Traditionally, no one's shocked by this, government is extremely siloed. So if you say, well, we're going to do pre-K for all, that's, you know, that's Department of Education, or that's Administration for Children's Services, and everyone else is just off to the side, just watching and doing their own thing, and good luck with that. What we innovated, in a way I've rarely seen, was we literally brought every agency with any pertinence to the matter into the room, 
and preached, and preaching really matters in government or any organization. We preached that we were one government with one mission. We were here to address inequality. The first thrust would be to re-engineer our school system to focus on early childhood. This would have a profound impact over time on millions of people. It's already over half a million kids have gone through pre-K alone since we initiated it. But it could not be done if it was just a department of education out there on their own. The budget office had to feel it was a priority, not a grudging, how do we make your life difficult? How do we nitpick you issue, but a priority. The health department, which had to inspect all the facilities to allow them to open, had to feel it was a priority. The IT folks with whom we were, on whom we were absolutely responsible, I mean, excuse me, absolutely um, requiring them to be front and center to pull off something of this magnitude, had to feel it was a priority. And we had to break the silos in the sense of saying, and this is where resourcefulness comes in, can one agency do something that another agency normally does, but we need them to be flexible and creative in this atmosphere? And I remember one day we were in the in City Hall in our regular war room meeting, and the health department was really stretched thin trying to inspect all these potential sites or pre-K centers. And they just were kind of throwing up their hands. We're like, we've got all our people. We're putting them all in play. They're all doing overtime. We're, we're running out of time. There's no way you can do it. They're kind of freaking out. And so I looked around the room and said, and of course we had our law department there too to help facilitate anything on a legal level. And I said, what's it going to take to get other agencies to do these inspections? And the law department said, we have to do a certain kind of waiver. And I said, can you do that waiver? And after the requisite grudging, you know, it will be a hassle. The answer was, yes, we can do it. It's a pain in the ass, but we can do it. And by the way, that's a conversation that happens every day in government. Get, let people get their pain in the ass part out. And then it's the bottom line question. Can you do it or not? And they're like, yeah, we can do it. So then I literally look around this big table. And I say, who else has inspectors? that you can free up since the health department is literally running out. And at the far end of the table was the fire commissioner. And he raises his hand and he says, we have plenty of inspectors. He says, now the law department says we can use them. We'll take a bunch of them and we'll go inspect pre-K centers. And of course I asked him, will you also guarantee New York City will not burn down in the process? And he said, yes, it's very important to me. But the point is, you should have seen the look on the Faces of the folks from the health department when this other agency was like, yeah, we can do that. Why didn't you ask? And suddenly we had enough inspectors. And if you look at those days leading up to the first, the opening of school, the first year we did pre-K for all, there was every attempt in the world, I'll conclude on this, but this is a really lovely thing. There was every attempt in the world by certain, certain less progressive elements of the media, let's call it that, uh, and a few political figures to say that this was being too rushed and that it would be dangerous. And in response, now that there was ownership, I remember very vividly at one point we were doing a press conference to respond to these allegations. And the fire commissioner was like this kind of central casting firefighter dude like step forward and said, we are inspecting these sites and we guarantee their safety. And he kind of threw down and he said, pre and I love it. I remember very vividly. He said, pre-K for all is a priority of the New York city fire department. <laughs> it's like, I was about to cry because it was like, it all came together and people found possibilities they had not found before. And Once the Doubting Thomases and the naysayers attempt to undermine your own confidence, attempt to turn the public against you, attempt to point out all your contradictions and you overcome it the first time, then anything is possible. There's that famous truism, you only get one chance to make a first impression. 
that day in September of 2014, when school opened, and on that day, 53,000 kids, the first wave, went from 20,000, and the last day of school in June of 2014, 20,000 kids walked out the door out of full day pre-K. Three months later, 53,000 kids walked in the door of full day pre-K. And the day came off without a hitch. And there was silence. There was no critic who could come forward because there was nothing for them to criticize. And from that moment on, we knew not only would we achieve the next jump and get to 70,000 kids the next year, we knew that the program would be permanent. And notwithstanding some budget ups and downs and controversies of the moment, I will bet you any amount of money it is permanent. But it's only permanent because that first day worked and it only worked because people came together to do things they thought were not yet possible. Thank you. Any questions? Pretty on time, huh, Tara? Yes, doing amazing. Questions? Questions, comments, ideas, criticisms? I have all of those. Right. Start, <laughs> you only get, start, choose your favorite. I'll start with the question. Um, you mentioned that the past two years you've been reflecting on things that you could have. Oh, you had to be the person in the crowd to pick that up. <laughs> why <laughs> why does that? Be the, gentle. The okay, gentle you'll be the nice version. Um, I wanted to just uh, like highlight the part that you said um, when you were looking for funding from other sources that at the time, you know, you couldn't think of it. And you're like, now, you know, you can kind of see right. where these other spaces existed. Um, can you share what those other sure. spaces are? And if there are any other post, you know, revelations or ideas and solutions that you now can see in hindsight? I think the answer, the first answer is to say, if we had thought more about the problems and challenges, we would never have proceeded. And I, I, this sounds sort of, you know, if not facetious, simplistic, but I really want to emphasize it. There was a beautiful mix of uh, inspiration, like grounded feelings from the people and understanding of the people's needs, some actual science and research, and then some ignorance that saved us because we were not paralyzed because we didn't know every detail to overwhelm us. Um, but in fact, one of the things that is striking to me in retrospect is if I didn't have any money from Albany, we proposed the tax on the wealthy, the governor and Republican state Senate resisted, the, the quote unquote Democrat governor and the Republican state Senate resisted, but we had created a groundswell that created tremendous energy in the Democratic assembly and freaked out the Republican Senate, the members from New York City, and they went to their own leadership and said, don't put us in harm's way, we've got to do something. And instead of a tax, they gave us an outright grant of 300 million. And they said it was for quote unquote, one year only. And we knew again, no one would ever repeal it or they'd just be politically dead. So that's what we ultimately got, sort of a plan B that worked. But if now what I know and what I tell leaders around the country is try every new revenue thing you can find, that's the ideal. But if you can't find new revenue, look around your current budget and show me the things that are more important than properly educating children. Right? Because I because we have the, the absolute scientific proof. If you're not starting with children at four, better even three or younger, if you're not starting, then you're actually not sincerely educating them. Because their brain development stops at five. Now, not stops, but you know, the crucial time of maybe mine did, but <laughs> the no, the, the crucial window is birth to five. So it is fact to say, if you're not educating kids in that time frame, you're not real. So I would say, look at everything you spend money on. And I'm not against parks. I'm not against sanitation. I'm not against transportation. I love all those things. But literally, are, is every dollar you're spending in all those areas more important than properly educating kids? And simultaneously relieving a burden on families so families can go to work. That's one way to say it. Then here's the even more controversial one. Look in your education budget. Within your entire education budget, 
what is what is more valuable than reaching kids during that time of proper brain development? I don't have a doubt in my mind anywhere in America. It, it wouldn't be a fun decision. But literally, strategically, the most important thing is to reach kids at that early point. That's also the greatest possibility of creating equality. Everyone starts at the same starting line. So even with the education budgets, if I had to do it again, now knowing what I know, if I had to cut from one other part of education to give to pre-K for all, I would have done it in a heartbeat. Who else? Hello. Uh, you had mentioned before about the issues of silos in- Louder. You had mentioned the issue of silos in government, but the issue of silos is in any large organization, Correct. including a corporation, all these other things. And I was curious, in terms of city management, have you seen outside, let's say, of New York, any other cities around the world who are able to, I guess, create that kind of collaboration? And I'll put a caveat here in a democratic society. I don't pretend to be an expert on how every city government functions. I think the places that have the most ambitious agendas do a certain amount of that. Um, I got to know some of my colleague mayors, obviously around the country, but also around the world, and have great respect for Anne Hidalgo in Paris, who's tried very radical strategies, for example, around getting cars out of the urban core and and you know a green approach to her city. And they've not always been popular, but I I know from uh, knowing her and her team that they created some of that same team wide focus. And I think the better way to say it is, is everyone great at cutting down silos? I don't know. But what I do know is the difference between a absolutely distinct vision, in our case, fighting inequality, in her case, a green city, that everyone in the public and everyone in the government knows is the priority. Because one of the things you also learn is you are educating your own government. You are setting expectations and accountability for your own government. You're changing their minds, too. You're the people who work for you. Wouldn't it be a great world if you just said to the people who work for you, do what I say, and they all just did it? They actually have to be educated and moved. So I have seen that, but I think it correlates to those very sharp kind of big picture agendas. Um, so you talked earlier about how when you were instituting your campaign, you noticed that like they thought that it was kind of okay and that what do you mean they thought it was okay. What do you mean? Sorry, the previous administration and your opponent was kind of and in you said inequality was so ingrained within the city that something needed to change. Right. Did you feel like you had to build into your campaign a redirection of inequality and like going towards equality versus equity? I don't, I'd be interested in your definition. I don't see, personally, again, this, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not as sophisticated as some in terms of language. Inequality and inequity to me are sort of similar concepts. Mm -hmm. But what I did feel was it had to be named and it had to be connected to our values and our future, meaning to say, okay, we are not, this is not okay, this is not acceptable, this is not normal, this kind of stratification, this kind of division is extremely dangerous. And it's going to lead to a society of folks who feel like they belong and they're bought in and folks who 100% feel alienated. It's going to undermine the values that have always worked for us, which is an inclusive approach. And it's going to make it a place that people don't want to be. So I tried to articulate that this was not just a moral question. This was like literally we would no longer be the same city, that we were getting to a very dangerous point and to put everything through that prism. But I cannot lie to you and say I had this incredibly developed philosophy of what pure equity would be or, you know, or, or how it would play out in every way. It was more saying the current path is unsustainable and dangerous, and we can actually do things ourselves. Like not everything requires the federal or state government. We can do things ourselves to alter that path in time. I do this and we'll go over then. Go ahead. Yes. No, wait. One more question. What? No, now I'm going to be difficult on you. No. Three more after this compromise. Go. Uh, and we'll okay. go to that side of the room. Sorry to divert a little bit, but um, before you left office, you were endorsing overdose prevention centers. Yes. 
what equity issue were you trying to solve there? And then what was your next step when before you left? You had a plan. So what was that plan? Well, you're generous to think I had a plan. I really want to thank you for that. I think we had more of a vision than a plan because we were on the way out the door. But we did have a belief in what would happen next if we executed well. So overdose prevention centers you know, is the basic concept, just for anyone who doesn't know it, that you recognize the tragic reality that there is a massive addiction problem uh, with opioids, that people's lives are in danger all the time. And what we're doing right now as a society is kind of not actually acting on the fact that every day people are shooting up and overdosing and dying, in many cases, in a way that could be stopped. And so overdose prevention centers, which are used broadly in Europe and Canada, other parts of the world, are a blunt acknowledgement. It's not a fun answer. It's not like something to celebrate. It's an acknowledgement that we have a, a overdose epidemic that you have to take the power of government and say to people who are addicted, come into a medical facility to shoot up. We're not endorsing your addiction. We're not happy about it. But if you do that, you can be protected against overdose. There are medical personnel there to reverse an overdose. Our real goal is to get you to treatment. Our real goal is to change your lives. But our first immediate goal is to make sure you don't die, as happens all the time in, you know, in bedrooms, in bathrooms at McDonald's, in alleys, et cetera. So we worked for a long time to set up. The equity ramification is clearly the overdose problem is it is it's all parts of society, but it hits a lot harder where there's economic desperation, lack of opportunity, lack of education. The next step was we thought if we got it right, it would unleash the possibilities around the country because somewhere had to be the place that proved that it could work. And that it would cause other parts of New York City, once they saw it was an acceptable approach and did not increase crime, other neighborhoods would start to embrace it as well. Three more started, you choose them. Hi, um, so what is your future plans? Are you thinking about presidential election or is that too daunting? Also, um, <laughs> I was curious- I'm gonna do a series of no comments, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, the New York City subway system, I feel has just gone down gotten downgraded uh, what do you think is um like what have you done to try to help that um system because i think that's important for new york yeah. new york that's that's it's like the, the subway system is you know heartbeat lifeblood you name it it's literally there's literally no way new york city can succeed without a better mass transit system um Two things, we added all sorts of other mass transit. We added NYC ferry, so now there's ferry service in all five boroughs, and that should, in my view, expand quite a bit. We did things like select bus service and busways that made buses faster. We did an expansion of city bike. You know, there's, we're actually still kind of nascent in how far we can go with mass transit, even in a super built up place like this. But the other thing vis-a-vis -vis the subways was congestion pricing. And with all the controversy, and it's imperfect, I'm the first one to say it. I used to have immense qualms about it. But I came to the conclusion that if we did not have a renewable revenue source, uh, there's no way the subways would survive. There's no way the city would survive. Now, that actually, in addition to some of the federal support that's come in during the Biden administration, puts us on a fairly sustainable basis for the future. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis future, uh, me, all I want to do is I want to get back to public service in some form. I don't know what that form is. The presidency is taken right now. Uh, <laughs> you know. um, also, just for everyone who, I wanted to say something super affirmational to everyone in the room, regardless of your age, your vision, your aspiration, that what I learned from Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Nancy Pelosi, Jim Clyburn, even Mitch McConnell in his own special way, what I learned from all of them is I have so much more career ahead of me than I ever thought I did. <laughs> so, so, you know, you guys, you can you can do any number of career changes, successes, failures. You can do it over and over and over again. And there's still going to be like decades more. We didn't even realize we had two more. Yeah, come on, the pressure. Come on, Tara. That's what leadership looks like. <laughs> Um, you had mentioned uh, 
in order to get policy passed, such as pre-K for all, that you needed to do coalition building. And how and what methodologies did you use in order to ensure that the communities that you were serving, that this was the policy that they needed? Well, the front end of that was the years and years of listening. So I, I mean, from individual conversations to listening to leaders and organizations talk about it, it was clear this was a unrecognized crucial issue to many, many families. And interestingly, it was a crucial issue to families along a spectrum, like families who had not yet had their kids saw it coming. Families who had just had their kids saw it coming. Families who had kids who were three and four and five felt it immediately. So there was a huge constituency of people who are like, this is totally broken and it's hurting our lives immediately. It's costing us a huge amount of money Remember, at that point, 10,000 to 15,000 for one year for one child of pre-K if you have to go to the open market. So it was economically, economically totally overburdening families. You couldn't even find seats in lots of places. And then on top of that, people increasingly understood it was hurting their child's educational future if they couldn't get early childhood education. So we had that kind of understanding of where the people were at and what the need was. Building on that to build the coalition, we I think a lot of people who did not start out 2013 thinking about pre-K in the political world, in the advocacy world, in the media, got very turned on to it, is the truth. It's like, this is why we have elections. And as you can hear my relentless optimism, I hope you're all enjoying it, uh, after And I have had my ass kicked so many ways in public life, and I've been through just ridiculous negative scenarios, and somehow I'm still peppy and positive. I don't know what's wrong with me, but, <laughs> the, but this is one of the reasons why, that you can take an idea that has not yet reached critical mass and help it get there. So a whole bunch of people who, if you had asked them on January, well, let me go back even before my proposal. If you had asked them on October 1st, 2012, how big a deal was pre-K to them and their organization, uh, you, they just their eyes would have glazed over. They're like, what are you talking about? By the time you got to a year later, it was like front burner for a lot of labor unions, for a lot of advocacy organizations, parent organizations, neighborhood organizations. I mean, it was just like it grew, it grew in ways we couldn't even trace anymore. Like we would see these, we would see elected officials freaked out that they had to support pre-K in places we didn't think there was necessarily a lot of support for pre-K because it just kept growing on itself. Part of what's amazing about the current political context is all the you know human networks, social networks, all the ways that information is flowing and persuasion is happening that are not traceable in the traditional sense. So this thing was like just burning up between different communities and people were feeling it. And for example, when we finally went up to Albany in the spring of 2014, we had a huge number of labor unions energetically on our side on behalf of their members because they were listening to their members who were saying it was very important to them. And the number one truth of American politics, this is it, everyone, the number one truth, the number one is that the political system has devolved. And I'm sorry to be, I'm sorry if I say something gendered, but is just plain documented. Women are voting so much more consistently than men. There are elections in America where the, the electorate is pushing 60% women. So far beyond the pure numerical population level. In an electorate increasingly dominated by women, the issues most important to women resonate much more deeply. Now, pre-K is an everyone issue. But I know in the labor context, a lot of labor leaders were hearing from their women members that it was a much higher priority than perhaps the male labor leaders understood. And that changed minds as one example of how a coalition built systematically, but also organically. And the last contestant, Tara, is? Congratulations. Hi. Thank you. Um, and you so get a prize. <laughs> you mentioned the three R's and we talked a little bit about 
how forward thinking you were during your administration and how you centered equity. We find ourselves in the middle of a crisis as some, as we heard about it during the introduction with regards to migrants. And I was just wondering what your thoughts or your policy approaches would be to our current migrant crisis and how you would center equity in your approach. Well, I am going to answer you, but I'm also gonna put some guardrails on my answer, just in the spirit of honesty, because I, know my successor well we worked well together obvious not a shock i agree with him on a lot of things i don't agree with him on some things nor does he agree with me on some things none of this is shocking but i do know that when a former mayor comments on a current mayor you're buying into a long prolonged discussion that i'm not buying into so i will i will keep it a little broad i I get people all the time who come up to me and say, oh man, you are so lucky you did not have to be mayor during the migrant crisis. And I do acknowledge that there's certain things that are good about not being mayor during the migrant crisis. But then I say to them, do you remember I was mayor during the COVID crisis, which was much bigger than the quote unquote migrant crisis. So that's my irony point for the day. Um, I think where we are having a problem. And I thought the president actually, let me ask, show of hands, how many people watched State of the Union or saw it afterwards, please? Pretty good. Okay. I would urge people who didn't see it to see it. You, you can love them, you can hate them, it doesn't matter. It was a very interesting example of both um, governmental message and political strategy. It was very interesting. And by the way, the only president since Lyndon Johnson to prioritize early childhood education, because for him to include in the speech, back to my main theme, for him to talk about pre-K and to talk about the developmental time in a child's life that we're missing, you know, from the podium in the House of Representatives, that, that's a big deal. That is not the typical, uh, the typical American thing. So I, I was very appreciative of that. But to the point at hand, I thought the president did a very good job of bringing it back to first principles of nation of immigrants. And he was quick to say, some people were here before the immigrants, some people came here in chains. To his credit, he put the whole thing in perspective. But that if we, if we buy into this terminology too much, then we are negating our, literally our persona, our values, our truth, our identity. So I don't like in the current dynamic. And I think the tabloids have led some of this. You know, I don't like that everything's a crisis. I don't like that everything is a negative. We all know it is particularly the province of the right wing to portray every immigrant as a potential criminal, which is the farthest thing from the truth. The law we passed in 2014 or 2015 was a good law because it said, if you've done anything serious and due process proves it, you're out of here serious or violent. And if you haven't, if it's a minor offense or due process proves you innocent, you get to stay. That's pretty sensible in my view. But I don't love the terminology crisis. It is not destroying New York City. That the, the COVID didn't destroy New York City. The depression didn't destroy New York City. Hurricane Sandy, 9-11, none of them destroyed New York City. In fact, we're at our highest population ever. And you can't afford the rent around here. This is the thing I always love to say. Anyone who's like New York City is being destroyed. Then how come it's so expensive? If it's so destroyed, you think you get a good deal. You know? <laughs> so like, I'm like, could you could you destroy us a little and bring the rents down? You know? <laughs> you know? But so um, no, I think the terminology is wrong. I think the value structure has to be pulled back. And then pragmatically, look, I am I believe something is coming that will change the dynamics of the border, and we can have a whole discussion about that. But in fact, I think the flow of immigrants is going to change and be somewhat rationalized before this is over. Um, and I do think, I think it's absolutely legitimate that the state and the federal government have not done their fair share. And, and to some extent, that's because of a divided Congress. But I still think, certainly at the state level, more could have been done. That part bothers me. Like, I think the mayor is 100% right. The state could have stepped up more, still can but it, no, it's not going to destroy us. It's absolutely not. And final point, we're, we're this beautiful, wonderful, diverse nation. And actually watching the State of the Union, it was gratifying to see the beginning of our elected government looking like New York, like, excuse me, I think looking like New York State, looking like the United States of America. Like if you looked around the hall, it was so different than say 20 years ago and the beginning of an actual representative democracy. But 
we are not having a conversation about labor, the number of working people we need in this country, what that means for the future of Social Security. Oh, by the way, our birth rate is plummeting, as is true in most advanced nations, advanced industrial nations. We need immigration to survive. So it's just how do we do it the right way? How do we think about it the right way? How do we embrace people? Yeah, there'll be problems. But why don't we start the conversation with this is who we are. And if we don't have the right amount of it, immigration, that's actually the biggest danger. Thank you, everybody.